Welcome to episode five of the Filming Mentries podcast. A couple of my colleagues and friends said to me that I probably need to point out where the word filmumentary comes from. Well, back in the mid 2000s, I had this idea of creating the ultimate behind the scenes commentaries of some of my favorite films. And that meant digging through hundreds of hours of video, um, interviews, audio, deleted scenes, alternate takes, and constructing these kind of timeline narrative behind the scenes documentaries. So you watch the film kind of in the order that you would expect it, but along with that, you see all the behind the scenes stuff in context and you hear stories from back in the day and also from more recent interviews. Forgive my slightly panting talking here, it's because I've decided to go for a bit of a walk in the woods in a place that's unfamiliar to me, but it's really pleasant out here. The crickets are chirping, all the long grass is swaying in the breeze, and it's just nice to get out of my hotel for a little while after being holed up here and at work for the last uh, last couple of weeks. So yes, filmumentaries.com is where you can visit and find those videos. There's also a Filmumentaries Vimeo channel and a YouTube channel. So please have a look at those if you haven't already. This week, for this episode, I'm talking to Kevin Pike, who I've interviewed a couple of times before, actually. I interviewed him for my Inside Jaws filmumentary, which was a feature-length look at Jaws from a slightly different perspective. Kevin told the story about how he got involved in the film, uh, the lucky, lucky story of how he got involved with the film. Uh, and I'll let him tell you again that shortly. He also talks about how he was the guy that ended up building the DeLorean for the Back to the Future movies. Um, Kevin is a bit of a go-to guy for all of those people that have converted their DeLoreans into inverted commas time machines over the years. Kevin's a really interesting guy to talk to. He's always good company and I hope you enjoy listening to my chat with him. I'm pretty sure we could have made a a 10-hour episode out of this if we'd have just carried on talking, but I had to stop somewhere. Um, I'll be back at the end for a bit more jabbering, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, first of all, for you know giving us your time, Kevin, and uh, it's always nice to talk to you. We've talked a couple of times before. Um, we talked for my Inside Jaws project, and we talked about Back to the Future some time ago, but one of the stories that I always found fascinating about you was one you've told many times, I'm sure, but how did you actually end up working on Jaws? Jamie, thank you for having me, and it's nice to see you again. I'm glad to be here. And I'm happy to share some interesting stories. Uh, maybe we can find some new stuff to talk about that the fans would like. But the one that they always ask is, how did you get started in the business? And rightfully so, because everybody would like to know how to get started in the business. There's lots of people that would love to have the, the shows and the work that I've done in my career. But luck would have it. And that's really how it all started. I was working as a busboy in Martha's Vineyard at the Harborside Restaurant in Edgerton in early April in 1974. I got a job as a referral from the bartender when we used to work together in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it was a very lousy winter season there. The OPEC had an oil crisis. The snowbirds weren't coming down the long trek to Florida. So we kind of hightailed it out there and got in early on the Martha's Vineyard summer cycle. Unfortunately, it was kind of cold. The dorms they offered for the local help were still uh, with frozen pipes, no water. I had to find my own room. Um, didn't have a lot of money at the time after the trip, and it was kind of uh, cold and dark. And there on a Saturday night on the Easter weekend, between e and Good Friday and Easter, I was uh, helping set up a table, and a six top came in, as we say, six guys. And they started talking like they owned the joint. They talked like there was nobody else in the restaurant. It was a quiet evening, and they were usually the ones making all the noise. So I kept my eye on them. I kept them watered and uh, taken care of real well. 
And I could hear that they were talking about movies. Their war stories is often what happens. And they left the restaurant after their meal. I started bussing the table. And I realized that when I pushed the chair in underneath, there was a, a, a valise, a bag that someone had left there. And I said, oh, my gosh, let me run out there and see if I can catch them. I ran outside. They were still in the parking lot joking and scratching and laughing. And I said, pardon me, did anybody leave this under the table? And one young man who turned out to be Joseph Alves, the production designer, said, oh, my gosh, do you realize what you've done? And I said, no. He says, you've saved my life. He says, do you know what was in there? I said, I didn't look in there. He said, well, in there, they're the storyboards. You know what storyboards are, son? I said, no, sir, I don't. He says, well, storyboards are like you make a cartoon strip of a movie when you make a movie so everybody knows what you're doing. And I said, are you guys going to make a movie? And he said, we sure are. And I said, what's it about? And he said, it's going to be about a shark that eats your whole island. And that was my first image and introduction to the making of Jaws. Incredible. I mean, just just to be in that position that, that, you know, it's one of those sliding doors moments. If you decided to look in there, if you decided to uh, to not chase after them, your life would have been completely different. It's, It's amazing. Those little moments, isn't it? We've all had where our life goes off in a different direction. So you then worked, went and worked on Jaws for them. You got a job with, with them and uh, you worked, I believe, painting some of the, the beach huts there on the, on the beach. Well, what happened was shortly thereafter, I was going to the post office hoping that maybe my father had sent me some money, general delivery. And when I went up the steps, coming down was Jimmy Woods, who was the construction coordinator for the show. And... He remembered me from the other night, and I said, hey, how you doing? Uh, Are we ready to hire? And he said, we sure are. You ready to go to work? I said, you bet. He says, well, start tomorrow. It's $3.50 an hour. He says, what can you do? And I looked him right in the eye, and I said, you just show me one time, and I can do anything. (laughs) And so with that claim, I started the next day. It was April the 18th. Uh, There was about 12 of us that got hired from all all kinds of uh, backgrounds from Finnish carpentry to tile men to all kinds of people. And um, he had a nice talk with us out there uh, uh, in the snow while it was snowing on us and gave us the riot act about what we have to do. And we're not Finnish carpenters building the Vanderbilt mansion. He was quick to point that out. He said, we're just going to put these together and slap some paint on them, take a picture of them, throw them in the trash. So we kind of got the idea. Um, I went on to become his uh, office coordinator after a little bit of cleaning up the shop for a few days. And I started going to the production office and getting the reports and the paperwork and his purchase orders and all the time cards, took care of the coffee breaks for the guys, made sure everybody got the supplies they needed, did the shopping, uh, took care of the blueprints. Everybody knew where we are and what we were doing. And I worked there in the construction side, basically as a local hire laborer. And uh, then it came time to start painting stuff. And we had to paint the cabanas and paint the lifeguard stands. And we painted snow fence for miles. And then we had to go paint the interior of the Brody house. And we learned some techniques of uh, wood graining and marbling and this kind of stuff for their interior, their kitchen. And I worked for Ward Welton, and I learned more about making movies from Ward Welton than anybody in my career. He was just a wise man, and he knew the game. He had been in it for a long time, and he was brilliant, especially when it came time to interacting with people. And he could read a person right away, and he taught me a lot, and I really have great respect still for that. After the painting cycle, I got a promotion, you could say. They said, go upstairs and meet a guy named Roy Arbogast. He's going to help unload the sharks. I said, okay. And we went up there and I introduced myself. We chit-chatted for a few minutes. And sure enough, three big trucks came in. And these were the sharks. They were still in the molds. And um, the tails were sticking out off the end of the 20-foot truck. And sure enough, we unloaded the sharks and opened up the molds and got them hung up so we could work on them. 
And I worked with him for quite a while, uh, mixing up the elastomer, helping make the pieces that we needed to complete the construction of the shark, fixing up holes in the skin, getting everything right, working on the articulation, see where the bends, the cracks, the stretches would form, working a lot on the jaws, trying to you know, mask away the jowls, putting in the teeth. We had a little hiccup. Somebody had used a, a marker pen on the jaws back in Hollywood, and then when it came out, that ink was still bleeding through. So it took us a lot of work to grind that off and then repaste some elastomer and sand that out. Um, and then, of course, the teeth were a big part of it. And then Ward and I got together again, and we started painting the sharks. And, you know, it was just two colors, but a special kind of paint that apparently only Ward could figure out. And we uh, ended up using a texturizing with silica sand and chopped walnut to give it that kind of rough look that a shark would have as opposed to something glossy, for instance, like a dolphin. Um, and uh, we painted the sharks, and then the boys came up and started working on the hydraulics and the electronics, and next thing you know, they were getting shipped out to the ocean. Wow. Being right there at that moment when the, the, the sharks were being created. I mean, did you, had you seen a script at this point or anything like that, or was it purely just on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, you know, you needed to do this job, then that job? Well, as everybody knows, the script went through some changes. Um, and Carl Gottlieb had done a finished bit of business with it. Um, certainly, they didn't hand out scripts to the laborers. And I never saw a script. I never saw Bob Matty with a script. It was somewhere in somebody's paperwork, I'm sure. And probably Bob had it. But it went through changes. And, of course, the, the shot sequence changed all the time, depending upon what they had available to shoot. Certainly the sharks were, you know, late to be finished. Um, and I never saw a script the whole time. So uh, it was news to me when I finally got a chance to read it. Yeah. And I, I bet it was quite exciting to find out that you were involved in the one of the, well, the biggest film of its era. I mean, that must have been a bit of a buzz, right? It was a bit of a buzz. Uh, you're making a movie about a 26-foot shark that jumps out of the Atlantic Ocean and sinks a boat and eats a guy. And so that had a lot of interest right there. And uh, Buzz got around. Universal was working on Earthquake on the Hindenburg, and this was like third tier, a little project, and it was away. It was on the other side of the United States. Um, but that buzz kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, and then... When we got the shark ready to go and it went out and performed and performed well, um, we knew that we had a very successful project to be thankful for. Um, I continued to work on it until mid-September and packed everybody up one by one. The trucks left, said goodbye, runway of tears, and uh, they gave me a little punch list of things to pick up and refurbs and take care of some business here and there. And, I was by myself for about a week doing the work, and finally I decided, you know, this isn't as much fun as it is with being with everybody, so I just turned the wheel around and went back to my hometown and talked to my father about moving out and came out in November of 74. Hmm. And if you're, I'm looking uh, at your IMDb list here, that, that moment after Jaws, there's like another kind of 10, 11, 12 or more titles that you worked on there. And then you again hit the kind of the, the, the big movie again with another Spielberg movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, you clearly had, had, you know, taken this role seriously working in the movie business. Uh, you jumped straight in there by the look of things and from Jaws. And then it was just a matter of kind of leapfrogging across these projects until you hit the next big one. I mean, I look at some of the movies that you're involved with, Kevin, and... There's some of my favorite movies that I grew up with, you know, <laughs> Close Encounters and obviously Jaws 2. And then we get up to, you know, Back to the Future and Jurassic Park. And, and how did, when did you realize that, you know, you could leap from being a laborer on a movie to being a special effects supervisor? Was there a, was there a clear ladder to climb? Well, there clearly was a ladder to climb. One of the goals was to get involved in the union, get time in to do what you need to do and become a member. And that gives you access to many more productions. 
But when I first came out, it was during the winter season, and there wasn't any work. Um, I had to get by by doing non-union commercials, wallpaper, painting, set construction. Um, wasn't worth a lot of money at the time, but I managed to stay afloat. And uh, then um, they had a call in July of 75 at Paramount, and they were hiring people and the union had been saturated, and I walked in and with the help of Richie Helmer, who I'd worked with on Jaws, and there they were, some of the same people that I worked with on Jaws, Roy Arbor Gass, Richie Helmer, Mike Wood, Cal Acord, and we were making sharks for a movie called Islands in the Stream. And, of course, I took to it just like I had when I left Jaws, and it kind of rubbed some of the feathers, some of the elder effects person in the shop, but I already got uh, schooling on it and I fell right into it. Then got slow again towards winter and I volunteered to make a living banging sets together at nights at Universal, which was, you know, just the bottom of the business, just making a living, waiting and waiting. Sure enough, after the first of the year, green lit Close Encounters and Roy called me up and said, we're going on another movie. So I realized that there's going to be highs and lows. There are times in between movies, and so you kind of got to watch the, that stock market and try to pay attention to when things are coming and what's going on in town, and I hear there's a show starting up, blah, blah, blah. And I got lucky to go with Steven Spielberg again, and we went to Mobile, Alabama for six months, and we did all the wonderful designs of the gags for Close Encounters, and I got to work with a wonderful man named Russ Hesse, who taught me a lot about electronics and was instrumental in helping me build the sign with him that plays the wonderful notes that talks to the spaceship. And we spent a good deal of our focus on making sure that that had its role and it was a starring role. Mm. Yeah, and another fantastic film. I just recently read the making of book on Close Encounters and Always good to get another insight, another perspective into a film that I've I've liked for, for for many many years. So being on Spielberg's kind of you see you see the sign. Oh uh, yeah, I see it there. Yeah. So Kevin is showing me now a picture on the on his wall of the of the sign from Close Encounters. Kevin has a has a nice gallery of many of the the projects he's worked on over the years. So it's uh, you're not going to see this in the podcast, of course. Um, you you worked on some some big films through that period there from I mean seventy nine you there's like twelve films listed here listed here up to Star Trek uh, the motion picture in nineteen forty one and I mean what we should say at this point I think for some people who don't know what a special effects supervisor does um, we should also, we should point out probably that special effects are very separate from visual effects aren't they visual effects being opticals or CGI now you were involved more in the practical the physical the tangible stuff so there's a couple of things that um, should be clarified that when you see a name of a show on IMDB it doesn't necessarily mean that I was the special effects supervisor of it. In the beginning, you learn. You get to work with other veteran special effects supervisors. They were called foremen back then. And they would put together a crew of people they liked. Uh, my name got around as, you know, s someone that could help get the job done. And I got hired by new people all the time. Whenever there was a show at a different studio, I had the opportunity to meet some wonderful people at each one, wherever I got employed. And... We do what is known as special effects versus, at that time, it was kind of optical effects. Um, sometimes they often called it special effects or special visual effects. But what we do is kind of the work that's in front of the camera, and they do the work that's behind the camera or in the lab or in the shooting stages for blue screen, green screen, rear screen at the time they had. And now, of course, it's all the digital art form. Um, we were responsible for all the atmospheric effects. Wind, rain, fire, snow, sleet, hail, dust, cobwebs. And you had disciplines that you had to achieve a certain amount of hours, like 400 hours in this genre and 400 hours in this. And then also, simultaneously, you try to get references from people that you met 
so that you're able to get your state pyrotechnic license, which gave you another credential that allowed you to go on shows. Hey, you got a powder card, kid? Yes, I do. I said, okay, come on, you're on this one. And they'd send you around. The boss of the studio would say, you're going to be on this show, this show, this show. 41, no, we didn't do too much. We were responsible for the electric lights, silly as it sounds, on the street, which was back in the 40s. Uh, Christmas decorations, any specialty lighting was under our, our uh, umbrella. And so you never knew what you were going to do. Sometimes it was a little bit on some shows. Other times you were on the show for the whole arc of the show, if you got lucky. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the first film then that you worked on as supervisor itself, going up to that, that kind of highest tier of, of your, your job? I was at Universal and... Um, like I say, bouncing around from the different shows, working with different supervisors, learning everything I could. And they had a movie of the week, which was kind of an expanded pilot called Girls on the Hollywood High. And it was with Heather Thomas and Eve Arden. And it was a little mystery thing. It was kind of like a spinoff from the girls on BJ and the Bear. And it didn't have a lot on it, uh, but it was my first movie of the week. And then shortly thereafter, my first film was called Partners. It was directed by Jimmy Burroughs, who's famous for his wonderful sitcom work. Um, and it was Ryan O'Neill and John Hurt, and it was a simple show, a couple of bullet hits, the usual wet downs, wind on their hair. Um, I actually can't even remember any major gag that we had to do on it. Um, but they, they had me on there for standby and anything that came along, and we went on location to San Diego, and that was my first show. It's called Partners. And then, you know, how did you get hired on Return of the Jedi? Because Return of the Jedi, being a location special effects uh, there, being in charge of those, I mean, that was a big show, right? Were you aware at the time? You must have been aware, I guess, that, that a Star Wars movie was a big gig, right? Star Wars movies are always a big gig. I didn't work on the first one. We were on Close Encounters. Um, and then they did Empire. And then Jedi was coming along, and all of a sudden, Roy Arbogast, who had the wonderful experience of doing seven shows with in the beginning of my career, I learned so much from him. Um, and he enjoyed having me on the set. He, he never liked to have to go out there and do all the talking and showmanship and everything like that. I enjoyed being on the company all the time. So he usually liked to put me there. And I, like I say, seven shows, and here comes Jedi, and he says, uh, we have to go up to San Rafael and we have to big, build another big 26-foot monster. And I said, okay. And so I went with him. He was working in conjunction with Kit West, who was the English special effects supervisor on the show. He went there, scouted that, what they were doing, what he needed to do to perform. Meantime, myself and another crew were in a, a shop near ILM in San Rafael constructing the big monster and when we finished it we ended up going to Yuma, Arizona and working out in the desert right nearby the California border and working on everything that went on effects wise with the mothership um, swinging Leah across the ropes, sparks from all the gunfire, the skiffs tipping and of course the stunt players in costumes falling into the Sarlacc pit and that was a big bit of business that we had to do just in its construction because of its size and then the safety it was all covered with very thick foam and then we articulated the tentacles Don Chandler did some sculpting Phil Tippett came in and helped with our articulation to make it easy and simple to do um, and watch out here comes some stuntmen and then Roy said you're going to go up north and I said what am I doing he said you're going to take the we called it the monster we're going to take the scout walker out of its um, holding area and set it all up, up in the redwoods, and they're going to come up and take a look at it and get used to it and get ideas and do all that. So he sent me up there. I hired a local crew, and we took it out of the boxes and put it all up there. And sure enough, Howard Kassanjian came in, gave it a review, and shortly thereafter, the crew ended up coming to Crescent City, and we did all the work in the forest with shooting up the Ewoks and the pyro and, and with the big scout walker, which took a lot of work, a lot of rigging. And that, what was that rigged on then, that scout walker? Was that on like a forklift or a tractor or something? 
Because you, you see it moving through. Don't... Yes, you do. Um, it, it, it stood up only because we had two large I-beam, 20 feet long, underneath the ground that we dig out with a backhoe and put them in, and then we clamp the feet to them and bury them because it was obviously too <laughs> top-heavy to do anything without being grounded in mm. some ways. Um, you know, we didn't have the luxury like the miniature just to glue the foot down. <laughs> um, and, yes. and, and, and we had to reposition the feet. We'd dig up some dirt, we'd unbolt the foot, get the crane on, slide it forward, reposition. We had to make a big frame over with one leg for, for the Ewoks to grab with a rope and to uh, ride oh, as yes. it went across. That was an isolated shot. And then later, of course, when it was mm -hmm. moving, we cut the head off of it and put it on a D9 Caterpillar and ran that through the mm. forest, and we did shots from up there because we had to do the scene with Chewbacca going up there and throwing out the stormtroopers, and we used that, mm -hmm. and we had guns on the side and pyro, you know, blow up trees and anything and everything and try not to hurt the Ewoks in the middle, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was a great sequence, that whole thing. I mean, you know, they made like a finale of the movie last kind of 50 minutes in that movie, <laughs> and... Uh, Great to have been involved in that in that uh, that part of the movie and the Sarlacc sequence as well was one of those ones that always fascinated me because I remember seeing those making of documentaries around the time classic creatures one was called and the other one was called Returning to Jedi the making of a saga and it shows you the the barges being built and all the woodwork going on and how many labourers there were and the stats on on this documentary just how much work it took and then it's on film for like eight minutes or something. And I think George Lucas actually says in this documentary that this mistake that many films make is hanging around to show off the work that's been done rather than focusing on, on the story. And it is such a fast paced sequence before you know it, you're back up in space and Luke's splitting away from, from his friends. And yeah, it's a, it's a great sequence with a big kind of sigh of relief at the end of it. Well, the one thing that I, that I always think about during that time when we were in the desert, was I grabbed the call sheet and it said coffee ready at 4.30 for 455. Wow. And I said, wow. <laughs> I said, Kev, this is, this is a big show. And we had a yeah. lot of people, the big construction, big art department. You had all the drivers, Teamsters going back and forth with, you know, you had to bring everything in. And then you, you know, cast, crew, makeup, hair, wardrobe, uh, you, 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 you count them all and it adds up. And then we went from that hot desert and we ended up in the nice cool forest with beautiful sequoias and just lush ferns that they brought in. The Fern Brothers had a crew that did nothing but dress the ferns to everything to give the Ewoks a hiding place, you know. I wondered if you went straight from the desert to the forest because I've seen photos of the the sail barge and the sarlacc set with the speeder bikes just lined up in a row and I'm like why are the speeder bikes there they they weren't in that scene but I guess it was just there that you were there ready for anything because you were soon off to go to the forest to, to shoot those scenes with the speeder bikes. I, I think they came with the 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 crew that might have come from England mm. we had a truck full of R2-D2s um, so mm -hmm. I, I can't speak for, but I do remember them. And then, of course, with Garrett Brown and his Steadicam, they did some wonderful photography with that. Um, yeah. and, and we did pyro to match. And uh, there was some, it was just a great show, big show. I really enjoyed the experience and I was happy to be there. You, you end up uh, going in between the low and the highs and not everything's a big show and sometimes you're making a living doing special effects on something somewhere but you're always learning you're always meeting new people and then all of a sudden a big one starts up and you're on that and it could go for you know six months to a year so the key really is just to keep working as much as you can and hone your craft and hopefully the the connections you make and the skills you gain are going to get you those big gigs again but ultimately i mean did the does the not that i'm asking you how much you got paid but did the, does the pay uh, is the pay set for your uh, at this point in your career by, by the unions do you get paid just a certain amount or if it's a big gig do you get more or do you get more days or how does that work once you get qualified as uh, what they call a one card you you come up as a permit 3 2 1 your one card 
Uh, you're technically a prop maker. You're allowed to build sets. But uh, sometimes when guys would get that card and they were good at effects, they were hired for effects out of that pool. Then you come prop shop where you learn how to build all the props, the breakaways, any kind of custom prop that you need to make in the shop. You learn that. You learn your hands and how to build and how it affects things and just wonderful craft to learn how to build all those things. Then on the effects side, you're ready to go. You're on the company. You're doing the explosions. You're rigging the gags. You're helping the stunts. Um, and your pay goes up. And so you can be a, 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 a journeyman, a gang boss, or a foreman. Um, sometimes if you're lucky and it's a big show, it's overscale. There was a time when we had a big rise in our pay during the universal heydays. And we did very well financially for several years uh, under that. When you go on location, you get the blessing of usually working on Saturday, which is an overtime situation. Sunday, that's a double-time situation if you have to put that in. Of course, it beats you up and it wears you out. And then you also get per diem. And so it, there's some benefits about going on location and going on the bigger shows. One of the things that always strikes me about people who've worked on film, there seems to be like a, a shared personality trait because obviously it's a very pressured environment. You've got to get things done quickly. You obviously have time to set things up. But if that gag goes wrong and you need to reset, you need to have everything to hand. You need to know exactly what's going to be done. You're problem solvers and you need to solve the problems very, very quickly. Do you think there's something in your personality that made you particularly good at this work? Um, yes, and yes, you're right. You have to build the gag uh, in the shop and you work it to death. You, you bring it to its breaking point and you learn what could go wrong and you try to think every which way they're going to shoot it, use it, how many backups you need, how many takes do you think you're going to need. Um, you never know what other elements on the set will cause it to go 10 takes, 20 takes when you thought they'd probably do it in three and it, it, you have to really put on your thinking cap and be prepared for anything. And when you get out there on the set, which is where I was most of my career, if something goes wrong, you better be able to, you know, mop up that spilt milk and get it back and get it live and be ready to go again as fast as you can. And I, I, I will say I had a knack for that. Um, they always enjoyed my rapport and me explaining to them th honestly about what was going to happen, how it was going to work, sense of safety, and just competent contribution. And if something went wrong, okay, we got it. I can fix it. Let's, we'll just turn up more smoke, blah, blah, poop, fan the other way, whatever it is. And you have to be able to think fast on your feet. And um, I survived a lot of tough situations by um, having that knack and getting through it with them. You told me, we spoke last week briefly, and you told me of one example on the Back to the Future trailer shoot out there in the desert, which I'm sure the listeners would like to hear. After we finished shooting Back to the Future, and I thought I was completely wrapped and was about ready to take a big sigh of relief, they told me that I was going out on the teaser unit. They had a company come in from New York, great people, Art Greenberg out of New York. I got to work with Richard Greenberg, um, and... They were going to design some shots that gave a little bit of mystery to what do we have, what are we looking at. We didn't have much time from the time we wrapped. I did a shot at ILM on May the 9th, and then, of course, the movie came out by the 4th of July weekend. So we went right away out to the desert to shoot the design of the shot, and they wanted to have both the fire and they wanted to have exhaust out of the, out of the vents. And we had plenty of CO2 extinguishers, but the air was so dry out there in Lancaster, California, it just sucked all the moisture out of the CO2 exhaust and it wasn't even visible. I thought the tanks were empty when they first did it. And I kept thinking, what, what's wrong? Everything that we did was right. Well, when you're in Pine Hill Mall downtown in LA in the middle of the night, it's a little cooler than out here in this hot desert. And I said, well, and I told the producer, uh, Brian Williams, I said, I, I've got an idea. I've got to go get it. I will come back with it. Uh, it's going to take about an hour. And he said, OK, good luck. And I jumped in a steak bed truck and I drove out of sight and went to a welding shop in Lancaster and ended up getting two large liquid nitrogen tanks 
and loaded them up because we had two vents and I know that we could plumb them. And sure enough, here I come back over the hill and he looked at that truck and he knew when that truck was coming that everything was going to be okay. And we did a great job for him. I ended up working for Art Greenberg probably on dozens of commercials. I directed stuff for him. We did all kind of car work, everything like that. It was a relationship that was based on being able to help them achieve their gag. And if it's not working, you got to figure out how to get it back on track right away. And that was a clear example. Yeah, so on Back to the Future then, you were, you were one of the people that put together the DeLorean and you've become the kind of go-to guy for many fans that have converted their own uh, DeLoreans into, in inverted commas, time machines. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of working on Back to the Future? Because that's a movie that still is so fresh today and so intriguing today. That so many people still love that movie. It's, you know, it's a big part of many people's childhoods and the car being a big part of that, of course. I was working for Hal Barwood, who was directing a movie called Warning Sign. Uh, he was a friend of Steven Spielberg's, and uh, they gave him an opportunity to direct the film. And we were in Utah, and we were about ready to start wrapping up. And that's when you start putting your feelers out to figure out what's next. And Dean Cundy, who I had worked with on Escape from New York, was the DP. And he took a liking to me. I was always very good about making sure the wet downs were there for the camera and we had guys ready to service it anytime it got dry. We had the fans, we had the smoke, we had everything. So it wasn't an impediment to his shooting and making sure his set had full ability to do what it wanted to do. And he said to me, I'd like you to introduce you to a show that's going on over at Amblin. And I said, okay. And I think he knew that I had worked for Spielberg camp before, but they called me in for the interview. And it was Bob Zemeckis, Bob Gale, Larry Paul, the production designer. Um, I believe Stephen was in the house, and Dean Cundy came. And we had a meeting. I had gotten a copy of the script before I went there. I knew how great it was. I knew how important the car was. I had done another movie called The Last Starfighter that had a star car in it, and I didn't have a hand in building it. And later when it was on the set, I got a lot of responsibilities for that that made it very difficult for not having built it. And I knew in my heart that if I went into Back to the Future, that car being a big prominent piece of the story, that I'd like to build it so I knew everything about it and what it could and couldn't do. Again, for that same reason, if something doesn't go right, you have to be able to jump back in and get it back on track. And getting something that that was a big integer of the story and not know about it wasn't something I wanted to do. So I made it a condition that if I accepted the show, that I would also accept being responsible for the build of the car. And of course, in the beginning, there was talk about uh, how we're going to make the people go back and forth in time. And you've heard all the other stories about the plasma ball and the nuclear bombs and the refrigerators. And maybe we'll use a Mercedes Gullwing. But they finally ended up talking about the DeLorean. And the next day, there was three cars in the shop, and we just started in on them right away. We had sketches from the art department, and we had wonderful help with Mike Chaffee, who was a coordinator, who helped uh, with the look of things, and, you know, these pieces could go here, here. We had a crew, 10, 20 men counting the electronics crew, Bill Klinger, and we ended up just designing it um, from the contribution of all the creative forces and we had three cars, and we made one that was perfect, the A car, inside and out. Everything worked on it, uh, everything that was supposed to happen. It told the story. It had all the bells and whistles for every part of it. They, we had to fix the speedometer to go up to 95. We had to put a little digital clock on top to help give the audience an accurate readout when it was going to go to 88. Bob wanted some more business behind Michael so that when they were on him, the audience could tell the car was going faster, so we built what we called the Christmas tree bit. Um, the, the exhaust out the vents, the car getting cold, um, the trails of fire, <laughs> the plutonium chamber, <laughs> the flux capacitor. There's so much magic in there, making sure that Michael would have a place that he could hit with his elbow to start the car, you know, is like all that, every element. And then, of course, we brought it to the set for Steve, Steven at the back lot, 
And he looked it over and he asked those pertinent questions. Okay, what happens when this happens? Okay, we have this. And he checked everything out, made sure that all the pieces were there so it could tell the story that Bob and Bob wrote that was so well. That's fascinating because it has to make sense, doesn't it, to the viewer. And of course, you uh, you started probably a very expensive obsession for some people who to this day are still... I've seen a few drive backwards and forwards on the motorways here in the UK that I'm sure were uh, were built... Uh, with the help of you, whether it's directly or whether it's through analysing photographs and, and HD and 4K releases of the movie to try and get that, you know, that final detail there. It's fascinating, that whole props uh, replication process, because people do get so obsessed with it, don't they? They, they do. Here, here's the reason why. It's just not a car. It's just not a car with a lot of goofy things on it. It's a car that tells the story. This is for that reason. And you can put the time in here where you want to go. And we have a plutonium chamber that we need for fuel. And later the Mr. Fusion. And, and we have to have this neon light come on. And it t everything about it was purposefully designed and created and placed. All the electronics had to do everything it had to do on cue all the time. And we didn't always have the luxury just to hook it up to giant computers and run it. There were sometimes guys on the other side laying down with manual switches, flipping numbers, and, and doing what it had to do to tell the story. So it's a character in the movie. And the, flame, the flames were certainly a big part of it. You know, the flames and the fact that it goes out hot and comes back cold. It kept telling a story right from its first opening sequence when it rolls out of the back of Doc's van, it was such a beautiful entrance into its showbiz. Um, but the kids like it because they like being able to achieve all those details, and they're fanatical about it. I, I, I'm honored to say there's probably a better part of 150, 160 different time machine replicas built around the world, around the world, Japan, Australia, all over Europe, big fans there. And it's a nice reflection on our creation. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to sit in one in, in Melbourne, Australia, actually, many years ago, um, maybe 10 years ago, because I, I work on the Formula One motor racing television coverage. And there was out on the grass there in Albert Park, there was a few supercars kind of lined up. And then there was a DeLorean at the end. Everyone was looking at the DeLorean, DeLorean ignoring the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis and the Maseratis. Everyone wanted to get in this car and have a picture taken. So... Um, you know, all, all testament to you and your, your team for putting together that, you know, memorable character. And it is a character, as you say. It delivered a big part to the show. It helped everything else drive forward. Absolutely. I was just jumping ahead here on your, your list of movies. And 1990s, I guess you started working on Jurassic Park. I mean, it was released in 93, but you would have started working beforehand. How... how Aware were you that this picture was going to be a turning point in the industry? Because in a way, it's one of those big films and it's one of those major big films that is a real kind of cornerstone. And it's a turning point in terms of the technology because side by side, there were physical, uh, tangible effects. Plus, of course, there was the, the, the CGI, which to this day, some of those scenes still hold up incredibly. To think that was the 1990s and the first real attempt to do something like that. How aware were you that, you know, the industry was changing at this point? As you can see, if you look on IMDb, my credit for Jurassic Park is custom props. And they had started the movie. I had seen some of the references where they were using um, some ostrich running across the grass to ultimately become raptor skeletons and um, I knew about it. My good friend Don Elliott, who had worked with me many times, came to the shop and said, we're going to need a big cage for the show, and we want to know if you can be uh, responsible to build that. And I thought, well, this is kind of nice, opening sequence where that raptor cage comes in and it ends up pulling the man in and showing the audience just how scary some dinosaurs could be. And they came to our shop with a set of sketches and the sizes, and we made this big thing out of steel. And then Stephen wanted to be able to see the eye of the raptor through a hole or window of some kind. But we didn't know where, so we made a kind of motif with holes almost like brickwork 
on the sides of it so he could have his choice of anywhere he wanted to and still give a sense that it retained the raptor and um, painted it up and sent it to the show and it turned out to be a nice op opening sequence and uh, letting the audience know just how scary the dinosaurs are going to be. Yeah, it's like that moment in Jaws when Chrissy gets pulled under. You think, oh, okay, we're in for that kind of ride. <laughs> I still think that film is great. I've introduced sections of it recently to my youngest daughter, who's five, and she loves some of those moments in it, you know, particularly the dinosaur reveal. Um, when you first saw that film, did you, did you think, oh, wow, this man, things have changed? Um, things have changed. Uh, the visual effects had really advanced for that. Um, is Stan Winston's shop and what they created, Phil Tippett, Dennis Murin, um, all, all the guys that contributed really did a fine job and sensational movie. Yeah, yeah. And how does then a special effects supervisor become a writing consultant for people who, who need help with their scripts, which is what you're doing now? I had a wonderful career and I got to do... TV shows, I did large features, I did commercials, I became popular for the car work that I did, and I did commercials for Michael Bay and all, all of the wonderful agencies. And I did still shoots for magazine covers that needed specially defined water droplets and just techniques like that. And uh, I did sitcoms. I ended up doing sitcoms, which I really enjoyed. It was theatrical. You're the other person on the set that gets a laugh besides the actors when things like, Mom, did Dad fix the garbage disposal? Yeah, honey, go ahead, use it. And it's one, two, three, splash, and you get a big laugh. And I really enjoyed the theatrical nature of doing sitcoms, and I made a living. I had a family, we needed food, and so you have to do what you have to do. And then um, I was working at Warner Brothers, helping build a big gag for The Ellen Show, and... I was just kind of disappointed with the amount of money that the effects supervisors were getting paid. And it had really gotten reduced down to quite a bit. Everybody was underbidding everybody else, so to speak. And I was always pretty good about making deals. And I decided that I would turn around and become an agent for the effects guys and then become uh, a below the line agent and ended up with, you know, camera and sound and wardrobe, everybody uh, I had 40 clients. I had six people working for me, and then I started doing a lot of pitch fest for, for writers, and I had producers, I had directors, and then I started working with the writers. I had more fun on that creative process, and a lot of time I wouldn't know about other people working when I should have, and I felt that with the writers it was safer. And I had read a lot of scripts, I took a lot of writing classes per se, but I understood story very well. And in coaching the writers about what they should write, how they should write, became a real tough challenge because you had to wait for them to write and wait for them to come back with it. And it wasn't always right. So then they'd back to the drawing board. And that went on, it seemed like, forever. And I realized that I had a better way of telling the stories than they were typing. And I decided that I would just turn around and help writers finish their scripts. I had heard wonderful pitches from people. But the screenplay itself was far from being perfect, the kind of script that you have to, to have to submit this day to for critical audience and critical agency development people. And so I help people finish their stories and they really enjoy my input. It's, a, it's amazing that you have had that long career and you soaked up all of those things and ended up doing something very different from, from you know, what was your core, core career. Um, I myself, you know, do training as well in my industry, in the TV industry, and you, you kind of forget what you know that other people don't. That seems obvious to you, but uh, to people who are just starting out, um, seems like the best advice ever. So it's great that there are people out there willing to uh, to pass on their their knowledge and their wisdom in in the industry, and it's uh, something that I enjoy doing to a certain extent. <laughs> No, you, I've had the pleasure of being on the set. I might be standing by with a smoke machine in the beginning years, but I got to watch the actors emote, and I had a script when I was a supervisor of the show, and I could watch them say the lines and make their moves and watch the camera move and the setup and 
watch how story got told and you know, I've read thousands of scripts over the years from the different shows I worked on of all different formats and genres. And um, it became a natural for me to realize what a script needs to be to tell the story properly and to fit in to the Hollywood machine because the readers just want to read a script and get through it. And if it's not right, typos, anything in the formatting, boom, you're in the round file. And there's 100,000 scripts get pitched every year so to get ahead of that you really have to do a perfect job and I coach them on on that mechanics and of course their story dialogue everything all the way from beginning to end it's it takes quite a while to get through it yeah and there's so many scripts that have kind of floated around for years as well people don't realize how long that process can take I think a lot of people have this assumption that you write a script, you submit it, somebody says, great, green light, off you go. But there are so many scripts over the years that have kind of floated around, even those that have been on the blacklist, you know, a list of the, the, the top scripts of that year have then been kind of forgotten and slipped back and uh, suddenly might reappear if the time is right or if somebody thinks back and remembers it. So it's a, it's an ongoing process, isn't it, trying to get a script to the stage where it's going to be filmed. I mean, that's a, that's a big, long process. Well, writers sometimes feel like they're going for uh, their doctor's degree. They just got to keep working, keep working, and keep working. Look at all the changes Back to the Future went through. Look at all the studios they pitched it to. Look at how long it took to finally get to be the hit that it was. And they knew that when they finished it right away, they had a big one. And um, that's, that's what happens in this town. You know, you might have a good script, but if it's on your coffee table and it's not on someone's desk, there's that process. How do you get it out there? How do you get it to the right people? Who's going to read it? Will they get it? Do they see what you see in it? Um, it's it's a fight all the way until somebody says, Ah, I get it. This is a good script. We should make this movie. <laughs> and then they may get lucky and it turns out to be a box office hit. Yeah, and we were talking, weren't we, um last week when we had our little pre-chat about how part of educating people who are writing scripts is about getting them ready for the constant change that will occur. I mean, I have a friend of mine who wrote a script back in 2015. The film was actually shot last year, but now COVID has arrived. The film is delayed. They think the ending might be a little bit too dark for audiences currently. It's been pushed back to next year instead of this year's release because they're hoping cinemas reopen. They're going to change the title. Um, you know, and, it, and, and as the person who wrote the script, that must be quite frustrating, but that must be something you have to um, teach people to embrace from the beginning. What I say to them is, it's never done. They say, I can't wait to get finished. And I go, well, it's never done. Um, you, you, you write it and it's finished and it gets submitted and they call you in for the meeting and they say, we like this, but, you know, it's like, we don't like the title. We want to change the boy to a girl. We want to change Japan to uh, Afghanistan and, and, and we want rewrites and they don't expect to have to pay for them. Or you write the script and you're on the set and you realize her line should be his line and his line should be her line. And you're on there doctoring it as you go along. And um, then they're going to add a scene and they're going to cut a scene, but they have to do something different with it. Or you get it all done and you go to ADR because there was a motorcycle in the background and you've got to rewrite some dialogue to help sell a point that they actually miss that's necessary for the story. Okay. And... Then maybe you go to a, a test audience and it, the last two scenes bombed and you got to write a new ending and on and on. I, I remind them that you'll be with this script for longer than you can imagine if it hits. Don't get too attached to it. <laughs> got to kill your darlings. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me about. Uh, it's always fascinating talking to you. I've I've enjoy, always enjoyed uh, doing it when we have when we have talked over the years, and um, really do appreciate you passing on some of your stories to us, and you know, hearing about what you're doing now because it's always fascinating for people to see uh, that the arc of somebody's career from 
you know, from humble beginnings to becoming the the wise sage, passing on his uh, his expertise. So I really do appreciate it. Jamie, thank you. It's always nice to chat with you. You always have uh, insightful questions uh, and uh, talk about things that the audience hasn't heard. That's so always fun for me. And um, yes, I'm I'm really surprised that uh, I learned everything by being a busboy. Um, and uh, now I get uh, to help those that want to get in and get something done. So if you need a script that needs some help, I'd be happy to help you. Jamie, thanks for your time, and uh, good luck with your project. Well, I hope you enjoyed my chat with Kevin Pike there, former special effects supervisor and now screenplay consultant. By the way, if you do want to visit Kevin's website, it's filmtricks.net. That's F-I-L-M-T-R-I-X dot net. And I wish Kevin well in his, uh, his new endeavours. Thanks for listening, and thank you too to my new Patreon patrons that have joined since the last podcast. If you want to help contribute, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. Even a dollar makes a big difference. It means I can take some time out from my usual work to do some of these projects like these podcasts and my other videos and things. It's really, really appreciated. So thanks to those that are already part of my Patreon scheme. The next episode, I don't have a guest lined up yet, but I have a couple of leads to follow up. So hopefully uh, I'll get one of those in the bag pretty soon. But in the meantime, thanks for listening and please do share, subscribe and leave a rating because it means that more people will get to listen to this podcast if you do that. Thank you for your support. Thanks for listening and I hope you can join me next time. Thank you.